start. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon our studies this morning. As we study and see how you interacted with your with patriot, patriarchs and led them in their quest to live in accordance with your will. Help us understand your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, this is chapter 35 of Genesis. And God said to Jacob, rise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the alien gods that are in the, your midst and cleanse yourselves and change your garments. Let us rise and go to Bethel. And I shall make an altar there to the God who answered me on the day of my distress and was with me on the way that I went. And they gave Jacob all the alien gods that were in their hands and the rings that were in their ears. And Jacob buried them under the timber, timbereth, that is by Shechem. And they journeyed onward and the terror of God <laughs> on the towns around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Lutz in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people who were with him. And he built there an altar, and he called the place El Bethel. Uh, for their God was revealed to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebecca, nurse died, and she was buried below Bethel, under the oak, and its name was called Alon Bakuth. And ja and God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram, and he blessed him. And God said to him, "Your name, Jacob, no longer shall be named." name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And he called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, an assembly of nations shall stem from you, and kings shall come forth from your loins. And the land that I gave to Abraham and to Isaac to you I will give it, and to your seed after you I will give the land. And God ascended from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he offered libations upon it and poured oil on it. And call, Jacob called the name of the place where he had spoken with him Bethel. Or Bethel. Uh, and they journeyed onward from Bethel. And when they were still some distance from Ephraim, Rachel gave birth and she labored hard in the birth. And it happened when she was laboring hardest in the birth that the midwife said to her, Fear not, for this one too is a son for you. And it happened as her life ran out of her for she was dying, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And, and Rachel died, and she was buried on the road to Ephrathah, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave. It is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. 21, and Israel journeyed onward and pitched his tent on the far side of Migdal, uh, Migdal Del Elder. And it happened when Israel was encamped in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, 
and Israel's hurt, and Israel heard. And the sons of Jacob were 12, the sons of Leah, Jacob's firstborn, Reuben and Simeon and uh, Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's slave girl, Dan, Dan and Nephtali, and the sons of Zilpha, Leah's slave girl, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram. And Jacob came to Isaac, his father, in memory at Hithoth Abar, that is Hebron, <laughs> where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. And Isaac's day were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his kin, old and sated with years. Esau and Jacob, his sons, buried him. After Jacob's disastrous inaction in response to his daughter's rape in the face of his vengeful sons, the narrative unit demarcated by this chapter is a collection of miscellaneous notes about Jacob and his household. The consecration of the altar at Bethel, the death of Rebecca's nurse, a reiteration of Jacob's name change, coupled with the repetition of the covenantal promise delivered to his father and grandfathers. Rachel's death in childbirth, Reuben's cohabitation with his father's concubine, the death of Isaac, this miscellaneous overview of Jacob's later career just before his son's enti entirely preempt the narrative foreground, bears the earmarks of a literary source different from that of the immediate preceding material. Nevertheless, thematic reverberations from the pivotal catastrophe at Shechem sounds through it. Okay. Who appeared to you when you fled from Esau, your brothers? Footnote. This clause was, takes us back to the dream vision relation rele, uh, revelation and promise vouchsafed the young Jacob in chapter 28 signals this injunction to build an altar as a ritual completion of that early promise. Any thoughts? I have I have a question. We hear we hear the word concubine over and over. Was there a leak in legal distinction between the wife, a wife and a concubine in their oh, yeah. society? Yeah. Oh yes. Of course. The wife had uh, um yeah. Well she was a domestic controller. Um, uh, concubine was uh, mistress. A mistress, yeah, that's the best way to say that. And, and that was acceptable in that time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yes, it was at that time, it would appear. Um that that is uh, was a human element and um what can I say? That's uh, was accepted at that time. Um, you know, Jesus says it's because of the hardness of your heart. Well, <laughs> um, divorce wasn't something they did uh, that much back then. They just took additional wives, but they weren't wives. They were, they did not have... Uh, the same status in the family. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
do I have Buddy today? Is that the other phone? Yeah, hi. hi. Okay. If I, if I uh, misspeak, don't hold back. Okay. The alien gods, although many interpreters associate these icons or uh, figurines with the booty taken from Shechem, Rachel's attachment to her father's household god suggests that others in this large retinue of immigrating relatives and slaves may have brought cultic figures with them from Mesopotamia. Yeah. The, uh, I just wonder how many people tried to go find the, the stuff that was buried. Um, well, they come up with an awful lot of it. The archaeologists, I mean, the ones that came here on exhibit and the ones in the Museum of Fine Arts and the ones in the museums that I visited in Israel and elsewhere in the Middle East, these figurines were very plentiful. Oh, yeah. If you go into uh, um, any of the museums over there, you see, uh, especially in Jerusalem, uh, you see all that stuff. Cleanse yourselves. Nam Saram aptly notes chapter 34 is dominated by the thematic theme of defilement. This chapter opens with the subject of purification. To the God who answered me on the day of my distress and was with me, when Jacob approximately uh, approximately echoes God's words to him in verse 1. He replaces God's revelation with God's answering him in his trouble and being with him, thus confirming that God had fully responded to the terms he stipulated in 2820. If the Lord God be with me and guard me on this way that I am going. Okay. You know, that, with all the interaction that uh, Jacob had with God and finally the wrestling uh, on uh, the Tobruk bank, uh, you know, that, that was kind of a collection of everything. The rings in their ears, as archaeology has abundantly discovered earrings, were often fashioned as figurines of gods and goddesses for them. Um, Barry, the verb taman is generally used for placing treasure in a hidden or safe place and is quite distinct from the term for burial that appears in verses 8 and 19 and 29, which is a verb reserved for burying bodies. Five, the terror of the terror of God. Perhaps in view of this writer, which is more instantly, in, instinctly theological than that of the immediately preceding narrative, the phrase means literally that God cast fear on the Canaanites in order to protect Jacob and his clan. But the phrase is deliberately ambiguous. It could also be constructed as meaning an awesome terror with Elohim serving as an intensifier rather than referring to divinity. In that case, the shambles in, to which uh, Simeon and Levi reduced Shechem might be sufficient reason for terror. Uh, Alan Bacha, the name means oak of weeping. Beyond the narrative, the etymology of, the, of a place name, there is not enough evidence to explain what this uh, lonely obituary notice is doing here. Okay. Um, nine, and God appeared to Jacob again when he 
came from Padamaram. The verb again, as Rashi notes, alludes to God's appearance to Jacob at this same place, Bethel, when he fled to Padamaram. This second uh, vision of the confirming of the name of Israel on Jacob is thus set in the perspective of a larger overview of his career flight and return. With both his eastward and westward trajectory marked by divine revelation and promise at the same spot, the first story of Jacob's name change is folkloric and mysterious, and the new name is given him as a token of his past victories in his struggle, sundry struggles with human and divine creatures. Here, the report of the new change is distinctly theological. God's word invoking both the first creation, be fruitful and multiply, and his promise to Abraham, kings shall come forth from your loins. In this instance, moreover, the new name is a sign of Jacob's glorious future rather than of the triumphs he has already achieved. And the crucial element of struggle is not in initiated, intimated. Mm -hmm. As elsewhere in biblical narratives, a sequence of different versions of the same event proposed different, perhaps complementary views of the same elusive subject here in the center and the enigmatic fact of the origins of the theo, yeah, theoprophic name of the Hebrew nation. All right, 14. And Jacob set up a pillar, the cult or commemorative pillar, the Bathsheba, figures equally in first episode at Bethel in chapter 28. Then too, Jacob consecrates the pillar by pouring oil over it. But here, in keeping with the most, the more perversively ritualistic character of the story, he also offers a libration and builds an altar before setting up the pillar in the place where he has spoken with him. This phrase occurs three times in close sequence. The underlying of the place recalls the emphasis on the key term in the earlier Bethel episode, where an anonymous place was transformed into the house of God. In the present instance, instance place is strongly linked through reiteration with the fact of God's having spoken to Jacob before the place is consecrated by human ritual acts. It is consecrated by divine speech. Some distance, the Hebrew kivart, kivart or haaratz uh, occurs only three times in the Bible. There has been debate over what precisely it indicates. Abram Ib Ezar, with his extraordinary philosophical prescience suggests nefak philological prescience suggests that the initial chi was a prefix of comparison, kaf hadimion, and that the noun barat was the royal measure of distance. In fact, modern Semitic Philo philologic, yeah, philologists have discovered it in Atticadian Cognate Meru, which is the ancient mile, the equivalent of about four and a half English miles. See, everything gets littler. <laughs> okay. For this one, too, is a son of you, Rachel in her name uh, speech for Joseph, had prayed for a second son, just as in her earlier impious demand to her husband, she has asked him to give her sons, not a son. The fulfillment of her uncompromising wish entails her death. Uh, 
I don't like that. <laughs> Ben Oni, the name can be constructed to mean either son of my vigor or on some what more tenuous philological ground, son of my sorrow. Given the freedom with which biblical characters play with names and their meanings, there is no reason to exclude the possibility that Rachel is pun punningly invoking both meanings though the former is more likely. In her death agony, she envisages the con uh, continuation of vigor after her in the son she has born. The tribe Benjamin will become famous for its... Mm, Marshall. Marshall Prawls. Okay, but his father called him Benjamin. In the report given in the biblical narrative, it is more often the mother who does the naming. This is a sole instance of uh, competing, competing names assigned respectfully by the mother and the father. Jacob's choice of Ben Yamin also presents a possibility of a double meaning. The most likely construed would be son of the right hand that is favorite son, the one to whom is imparted special powers or dexterity. But the right hand also designates the South in biblical idiom. So the name could mean dweller in the South. Again, the Yamin component might be as, as some have proposed, not the word for the right hand, but a plural of yom, day or time, yielding a sense of son of old age. Okay, I guess you can take your point, uh, choice. Your pick. <laughs> All right. Uh, 22. Uh, Robert, you want to take that on? 22. Re Reuben yeah. went and lay with Bilha. The enigmatic notice of Reuben's violation of his father's concubine is conveyed with gnomic conciseness. The Talmud saw in the story the intention on the part of Reuben to defile the slave girl of his mother's dead rival, Rachel, so to make her sexually taboo to Jacob. More recent comments commentators have, have observed with just, justice that in the biblical world, cohabitation with the consort of a ruler is a way of making claim to his authority, as when the usurper Absalom cohabits with his father, his father David's concubines. So Reuben would be attempting to seize in his father's lifetime the firstborn right his firstborn's right to be head of the clan. And Israel heard. Same verb is used when the report of the rape of Dinah is brought to Jacob. In both instances, he remained silent. The fact that he is referred to in this episode of in this episode of Israel, not Jacob, may be dictated by the context of sexual outrage for which the idiom of scurrilous thing in Israel, Navala the Israel, the Israeli, is used as in the story of Dinah. The sons of Jacob were 12. The genealogical list of the sons of Jacob, followed by the list of the sons of Ishmael in the next chap chapter, mark a major transition in narrative. The story picks up again at the beginning of chapter 37. So old Jacob is very much alive and a very important figure in the background of the narrative. It will become the story of Joseph and his brothers. Tell that in all its psychological richness and moral complexity would take up the rest of the book of Genesis. And Israel breathes last. The actual chronological place of this event is obviously considerably earlier in the narrative. Biblical writers observe no fixed commitment to 
the linear chronology of phenomenon recognized by the rabbis in the dictum. There is no early, there is neither early nor late in the Torah. Esau and Jacob, his sons, buried him. At this point, they act in unison, and despite despite the reversal, birthright, and blessing, the firstborn is mentioned first. This is still the oldest. Okay. I, ha I have a question, Pastor. A Go couple ahead. of times, he, the writer here, has said that this chapter appears to have been written by somebody else. Yeah, this is this is a, uh, yeah, this is the this um, whole uh, ideas concerning uh, selection of stuff uh, brought in and somebody being an editor to it and it not being Moses. Um, the Toledoth in Genesis appears to be that's a. It's a statement. It's about the, the genealogies and uh, of Adam, and then it goes all the way down until we get to the flood. Um, that seems to be a record, a toledoth, uh, to be a, a statement for a record. So this could have been a collection at that time that was carried down, and this is just a recording a historic of that. Um, but these statements concerning what took place as far as Jacob or uh, well, all the way down through it is a discussion on uh, something that Moses wrote. But the time of the higher criticism and the ideas concerning the JEPD -E theory um, created uh, this kind of thinking. And you're seeing that same type of thinking. This is this historical, critical um, interpretation of the Bible. Now, so this is not biblical, historical, as Luther had, had talked. But it, this, is, uh, this is taking and Trying to take the, the Bible, which is written to give us a history of, of salvation, so it's uh, uh, special in that respect, uh, it's not just a secular history. Uh, what what had, takes place is that looking at these separate things they're saying oh this was written by who and this this came in from somebody else this is all this source uh theory now i don't you know i know that moses wrote the the genesis so i just uh disclaim the other portion as far as what's taken in um because often it's used to, to to bounce one against the other, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's not done to improve faith. It's not done to improve history or understanding. It's done more, or at least the effect is that it leads away from faith. Um, so, if you're asking me about it, that's where this writer is coming from. He is a J U B. J-E-P-D theorist. And so the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are supposedly coupled together during the, the um, Babylonian captivity to try to give a narrative to the children of Israel while they're in captivity and try to hold the nation together. That is their purpose uh, as far as they're concerned. Where that falls apart um, by hard historical evidence is the the Samaritan Pentateuch, which reads the same, but uh, you know was in written in pre-exilic or pre-exile script, not alone 
you know, that, that we would say that, but it's actually the script is pre-exilic. So um, I kind of let that those statements and like just kind of bounce off of my mind and say, okay, I don't pay attention to that. This is a guy that's stuck in that theory. And they, they keep trying to underwrite that theory with this these comments. Uh, you know, it's like thinking that you're going to write all of the stuff that you write in a day or in a, in a week. Uh, and it's all going to be nice and smooth and kept as a journal that uh, nobody's keeping a journal here. This is now a discussion with God and, and, and Moses concerning mm -hmm. what took place. Mm -hmm. And why it's that way, I don't know. But if you look at the the uh, the rest of uh, Genesis and you look at all the others, you see that this is kind of the way that uh, this was done. It's kind of like you get a step it here and step it there. Moses didn't sit down in one week and write down the book of Genesis as it was dictated to him. This is over specific periods. Do you think that the, uh, the various the, the archaeological discoveries are they sufficient no. evidence no, for the? No, uh, I don't. I don't think they're fake. All right. No, no. I'm saying are they are they sufficient evidence for the historical accuracy of Genesis? Yeah. It, um, I I believe that that it's the only place where we can have things thrown up and uh, questioned. What takes place is the, the devil only has a few places to grab a hold of us. One of them is our mind. And it is through causing doubt. Um, he's a deceiver. He doesn't create anything, but he distorts things. And so he gives us a picture and we distort it. Oh, that's probably this way, you know. At the same time, we run around with this idol, if you would, of yourself. Um, you're going to be the judge. We're, we're living in uh, uh, postmodern times, but uh, the enlightenment brought to the point of fulfillment is where we're living today. We've changed from a God that we accept as sovereign to a God who makes the decisions, which is I. I decide. I'm the captain of my own soul. That type of idea. That's what enlightenment has brought us to. So that's why we, we act and, and function in the way we do. Um, and the decisions of that uh, affect us because it's a culture in which we live in. And so the devil uses that. And we puff ourselves up with the idea that we... We know better. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at. So those things that would bring doubt to our mind concerning faith, um, now those are tools of the devil. Any comment, buddy? Well, yeah, there's a lot of what you say. I think that, I mean, there's there's such a thing as, you know, philosophy and, and academic research being harmful, but there's also such a thing as bad scholarship and bad philosophy. And yeah. some of the higher criticism actually suffers from that. And what I'm getting at is that uh, philosophers, philosophy students are cautioned that, including pre-law students and theology students, are cautioned that, you know, arguments can't be constructed on on facts that can't be known. So in response to Robert's question, <clears throat> a lot of this history really can't be known. So the higher critic is working on something, on, an, on a fact that can't be known. And when you mentioned the, the uh, uh, possibility of the Pentateuch being written in the Babylonian exile, I was only dimly aware of that theory, you know, certainly not as conversant with that as you are, but uh, I thought, you know, when you were talking about it, I said, well, that makes a certain amount of sense, right? I mean, if you look at it just objectively, there's a certain amount of sense to that. But then when you mentioned that the uh, 
Sumerian Pentateuch followed the same line. I, I didn't know that. So I thought, well, that completely destroys that theory. I mean, it's an interesting theory. It yeah. makes sense, it makes some kind of historical sense. But if the Samaritans had the same Pentateuch, then it's no theory at all, right? And when, uh, uh, you know, archaeology is kind of an ongoing project, kind of in response to Robert's observation as well. And, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, kind of the treasure trove of unknowable facts, because there's always facts continually and, and information continually coming to light. I remember years ago, there was, and you remember this probably, undoubtedly, was, there was this claim that uh, the Jews were never in Egypt as slaves yeah. uh, because yeah. there wasn't any archaeological, you know, information about them being there under Ramses II or anybody else. But then somebody dug up these, these uh, hieroglyphics w in which the Egyptians were talking about the Ivrit, the Ivrit, the Ivrit. Well, that is Hebrew for the Hebrews, right? <laughs> That's the Hebrew name for Hebrews. And, and what it literally means is the people that came from across the water or come from across the river or something. So the Hebrews, you know, they're referring to the people that come from, you know, the other side of the Red Sea or, you know, from across the River Jordan, wherever, you know, they, they come from some, some other place. Uh, these have read, these have read, these have read. And there's lots of references to them. So it's kind of an ongoing thing. But, you know, one of the problems with this uh, uh, kind of um, mental archaeology or textual archaeology is that, you know, it's full of unknowable facts. I mean, I was, you know, talking to my wife about this the other day, and I was saying that, you know, people are constantly trying, you know, and an and illustration of the unknowable fact is you open a, a book or an article and, Somebody's talking about, you know, whether, you know, Abraham Lincoln suffered from mental illness or something, right? And this author will go on for 100 pages on this, but there's no way you can really know that. You know, Abraham Lincoln's gone. Everybody who knew Abraham Lincoln is gone. You know, you're relying on some texts that are really very subjective. So a lot of that goes on, and it's not just, it's, of course, it uh, plays into the, the, the demonic uh, uh, agenda. But it's also sometimes just bad scholarship. Yeah. Which also plays into the demonic agenda. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, he's no stranger. To, he can use bad scholarship as well as anyone, right? Yeah. Okay, let's go on then. Um, Robert? As long as you can take Continue. Keep it up. Keep it going. Okay. Chapter 36. And this is the lineage of Esau, that is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. Ada, daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Ohalubima, daughter of Anah, son of Zibion the Hivite. Basemath, daughter of Ishmael, sister of Maybe off. Ada, I'm sure I'm butchering these names. And Adar bore to Esau Eliphaz, Eliphaz why Basemith bore Ruel. And Ohar Libama bore Jeus and Jalem and Korah. And these are, these are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the folk of his household and his livestock and all his cattle and all the goods he had gotten in the land of Canaan. And he went to another land away from Jacob and his brother. He went away from Jacob, his brother. For this substance was too great for dwelling together and the land of their sojournings could not support them because of, of their livestock. And Esau settled in the high country Spear, Esau, that is Edom. And this is the lineage of Esau, father of Edom, in the high country of Seir. These are the names of the sons of Esau. Eliphaz, 
Eliphaz, son of Ada, Esau's wife, Ruel, son of Basemath, Esau's wife, and the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, and Gadim, and Kanaz. Timna was a concubine of Eliphaz, son of Esau, and she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. These are the sons of Adar, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Ruel, Ahath and Zerah, Shama and Mizah. These were the sons of Basemoth, Esau's wife. And they, these were the sons of Esau's wife, Ohalubayim. Oh, 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 Bema, daughter of Anar, son of Zibion, she brought to Esau, Jush, Jush, and Jalen, and Korah. These are the chieftains of the sons of Esau, sons of Eliphaz, firstborn of Esau, the chieftain Tamar, the chieftain Omar, the chieftain Zepho, Chieftain Kenaz, the Chieftain Korah, the Chieftain Gadim, Chieftain Amalak. These are the Chieftains. These are the Chieftains of Edom. Eliphaz, the land of in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adar. These are the sons of Ral, son of Esau, the Chieftain Ahat, the Chieftain Zerah, the Chieftain Shamar, the Chieftain. These are the these are the chieftains of rule in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Bas Basemath, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Holy Bema, Esau's wife. The chieftain Juah, Jush, the chieftain Juma, the chieftain Korah. These are the chieftains of Holy Bema, daughter of Anar, the Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is Edom, and they're the chieftains. So I'm gathering from all these chieftains, this was a more militaristic society than than uh, Jacob's. This is a very Esau society, is more a warrior society, a more militaristic society. I would say, okay, and more. I, I think by by reading that you see that they they kind of a divided family by be, being chieftains. That's their own uh, groups, as I understand it. Um, it's not it's not necessarily a military military term here. Well, they they I can't say. I don't know. Well, I think it could be. You when you, when you see so many of them there. It, it suggests that if they do have, like, like if they are warlords, there's so many chieftains that none of these groups could be that large. I mean. Well, at the beginning, not that large, but we look at Abraham uh, initially when he was, when he went to save Lot, he had, what, four or five hundred men with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's they, a good size group. Yeah, you you could grow a, a pretty good size group, but the, each one of these is a separate group. So, um, kind of see the the that kind of splitting apart um, more the way I see them. But I don't know if that's true. You have to read more on them. I never. Uh, I've spent a whole lot of time on things like uh, Esau, uh, the Muslim, uh, you know, the connection, line connections through that. That's not where my interest has been. Yeah, the, the, I think I, think I, I mentioned the, 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 the uh, Talmud, uh, uh, the medieval Talmud referring to uh, Muhammad, not by his I mean, Jesus being referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, but uh, Muhammad simply being referred to as the Ishmaelite. <laughs> yeah, it's a medieval Jewish literature. Okay, 
thank you, Robert, for all right. struggling through all that. Um, buddy, you want to take it from there? The uh, footnotes, I presume, right? Yeah. Uh, I think. No, we still have we still have a little bit more to go. Yeah. These, these are the okay. sons of, of Seer the Horai. I got lost here while I was talking. Okay. Uh, Robert, go ahead and finish that. Bring it down to the footnotes. These are the sons of Seer the Horai who had settled in the land. Lotan and Shobar and Zibion and Anar. Dishan and Ezer and Dishan. These are the Horat chieftains, son of Seir, in the land of Edom. Sons of Lotan were Horai and Man. Lotan's sister was Timna. These are the sons of Shoba, Alvin, Danahoth, and Ebel, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion, Adar, and Anar, who he is Anar, who was found in the water in the wilderness when he took the asses of his father Zibion to grave. These are the children of Anar, Dishon, and, and our holy beam Bama, daughter of Anan, and these are the sons of Dishon, Hemdan, and Eshban, and Ithran, and Sharan. These are the sons of Ezar. Johan and Zavan and Achan, these are the sons of Dishan, Oz, Oz and Iran. These are the Horite chieftains, the chieftain Lotan, the chieftain Roba, the chieftain Zibion, the chieftain Anan, the chieftain Dishan, Ezar, and Dishan. These are the Horite chieftains by their clans in the land of Seir. These are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. And Bela, son of Bor, Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhaba. Bela raised, and Jobab, son of Zawar from Basra, reigned in his stead. Reigned in his stead. Jobar died, and Hushim from the land of the Tanamite reigned in his stead. Hushim died, and Hadar, son of Dadad, reigned in his stead, who was struck down, who, he who struck down Midian on the step of Moab, Moab, and the name of his city was Ezit. Hadar died, and Samar of Asrakar reigned in his stead. Samla died and Saul from Elbert on the river reigned in his stead. Saul died and Baal Hanan, son of Akbar, reigned in his stead. Baal Hanan, son of Akbar, died and Hadad reigned in his stead. The name of his city was Al. Name whose wife was Mahatabel, daughter of Matrit, daughter of Me Zahab. These are the names of chieftains of the Ayah clans and places by their names. Chief Tamar, Chieftain Alva, Chieftain Seth Head, the Chieftain Holy Bama, the Chieftain Elar, Chieftain Sinon, Chieftain Kanaz. Kenan, Mibzar, Amdio, Aram. These are the chieftains of Edan, the settlements in the land of their holdings. That is Esau, father of Edom. True. That was a workout. I'm sure I bunched, batched, bunched up, messed up those words, those names. You did good. Okay, well, thank you, Robert, for, for getting through that. Um, I guess I saved myself from, <laughs> from that. Okay. Uh, well,
Well, we've got time for some of the footnotes, so let's go ahead and try it. No. Do we have any footnotes? Yes. Yes, the first one, chapter 36. Uh, buddy, you want to start with that one? Uh, chapter 36 offers the last of the genealogies in Genesis. These lists of generations, uh, totally the end of kings, obviously exert an intrinsic fascination for the ancient audience and served as a way of accounting for historical and political configurations which were conceived through a metaphor of biological propagation. In fact, virtually the only evidence we have about the Adamite uh, settlement is the material in this chapter. As a unit in the literary structure of Genesis, the genealogies here are the marker of the end of a long narrative unit. What follows is the story of Joseph, a continuous sequence that is the last large literary unit of Genesis. The rule of Esau's genealogy is clearly analogous to that of Ishmael's genealogy in chapter 25, before the narrative goes on to pursue the national line of Israel. An account is rendered on the posterity of the patriarch's son, who is not the bearer of the convental, convental promise. But Isaac, Isaac has given Esau too a blessing, however qualified, and these lists demonstrate the Im implementation of that blessing in Esau's posterity. The chapter also serves to shore up the narrative geographically to the east before turning to the, the to turning its attention to the south. Apart from the brief report in chapter 12 of Abraham's surgery to surgery in Egypt, which is meant to foreshadow the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, the significant movement beyond the borders of Canaan has all, all been eastward across the Jordan uh, to Mesopotamia and back again. Esau now makes his permanent move from Canaan to Edom, the mountainous region east of Canaan, south of the Dead Sea, and stretching down toward the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, once this uh, report is finished, our attention shall be turned first to Canaan and then to Egypt. This is the first of six different lists, perhaps shown from different archival sources by the editor that make up the chapter, though it does um, re record Esau's sons, the, the stress is on, on the wives. There are both overlap and inconsistency among the different lists. These need not detain us here. The best account of these sundry traditions, complete in charts, is the discussion of this chapter in the Hebrews Encyclopedia uh, through Nehem Sarna, though Nehem Sarna provides a briefer but helpful exposition of the list in the commentary. Anna, son of Zibion, the Mes Masoretic text has daughter of, but Ara is clearly a man, and several ancient texts read son. Uh, another land. The translation follows the explanatory gloss of the ancient uh, targum, Targums. Uh, the received text has only a land. The land could not support them. The language of the entire passage is reminiscent of the separation between Lot and Abraham in chapter 13. It's noteworthy that Esau, in keeping with the loss of his birthright and blessing, concedes Canaan to his brother and moves his people to the southeast. The second unit is, is, is genealogical, is genealogical, but focusing on sons rather than wives. <coughs> These are the chieftains of the sons of, oh, wait a minute, uh, Timotna, a, a concubine, bore uh, Antelic. If Antelic is subtracted, we have a list of 12 tribes, as with Israel and Ishmael. Perhaps the birth by a concubine is meant to set Arnelach apart in a status in a status of lust of legitimacy. Arnelach, uh, Amalek, becomes the hereditary enemy of Israel, whereas the other Edomites had normal dealings with their neighbors to the west. The third unit is a list of chieftains that's centered from Esau. Chieftains. It's been proposed that the Hebrew chief, Aluf, means clan, but that seems questionable because most of the occurrences of the term elsewhere in the Bible clearly indicate a person, not a group. The difficulty is uh, obviated if we assume that an Aluf is the head of an Oleth, a clan. Uh, the one problem with this uh, uh, 
construal, the fact that it verses that in verses 40 and 41, Aluf is joined with a feminine proper noun may be resolved by seeing a construct there, chieftain of Tima instead of chieftain Tema. Okay. The fourth unit of the chapter is a list of Horite inhabitants of Edom. The Horites, uh, evidently the term was used uh, interchangeably with Hittite, uh, were most probably the Hurrians, the people who uh, penetrated into this area from Armenia sometime at the first half of the second millennium uh, BC. They seem to have been largely assimilated into the local population, a process uh, uh, reflected in the fact that, like everyone else in these lists, uh, they have West Semitic names. Uh, who had settled in the land? Settlers or inhabitants of the land, uh, that is uh, in the Hebrew, that is the Horites, were the indigenous population by the time the Edomites uh, invaded from the West during the 13th century BC. Um, Aya, the, the Masoretic text reads, um, Aya, who found the water in the wilderness, the object of the verb in the Hebrew, Yamim, is an anomalous verb and venerable traditions that refer, that uh, render it mule or hot spring, mules or hot springs have no philological basis. The translation follows uh, Spicer's plausible suggestion that a simple transportation of the first and second consonants of the word has occurred and that the original reading was uh, Mayim water. Discovery of any water source in the wilderness would be enough to make it noteworthy for posterity and also a place name. The Masoretic text reads Dishan, who is a brother and whose offspring are recorded two verses later. There is support for Dishan in some of the ancient versions. Uh, by, their, their, by their clan, the translation revocalizes the Masoretic uh, Alufaim, Alufahim, uh, as uh, Alfahim, uh, to yield clans. The fifth unit of the chapter is a list of the kings of Edom, they do not constitute a dynasty. Um, before the king reigned over the Israelites, the phrase refers to the establishment of the monarchy, beginning with Saul, and not, uh, as some have proposed, the imposition of Israelite suzerainty uh, over Edom the, by David because of the particle Edele uh, to for either than um, E from, uh, prefixed me from. Uh, prefix to the Hebrew for Israelites. This is one of the brief moments and when the later perspective of time of the writer, perspective and time of the writer, pushes to the surface in the patriarchal narrative. Hmm. Um, Rehabeth on the river, Rehabeth means uh, broad places in urban context in the singular, it doesn't make the city square. Here it, it uh, means something like uh, meadows. Rehoboth on the river is probably meant to distinguish this place from some other Rehoboth differently situated. Uh, Hadal, uh, the Meser Hadad, the Masoretic text has Hadar, but this is almost certainly a mistake for the well-attested name Hadad as, is, as chronicles and some ancient versions and manuscripts read. In Hebrew, there is only small difference between the graphemes for R and for D. And, and that's, you know, we talked about how in Hebrew kind of helps to know what you're reading before you read it. The sixth and concluding list of the collection is another record of the chieftains descended from Esau. Most of the names are different, and the list may reflect a, a collation of archival material stemming from disparate sources. And this source of stitching together of different testimonies would be in keeping with ancient editorial practices. Okay. Okay. Um. This society that Esau's descendants were, were established in was mostly polythe polytheistic. Uh. 
I can't. I can't make that statement. Um, um, now you were asking whether it's polytheistic. Uh, as I as I said earlier, I haven't really studied them, so I couldn't tell you. Uh, I'm assuming that they were the same as the others around, but Esau also was, you know. Um, you know, Isaac is his father, so. And, and he wasn't, so. I, I, I can't answer that. Uh, I can assume that he, that it probably went the way of that whole Mid-Eastern area, but uh, I have nothing to, to back that with anything. Okay, well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, let's uh, let's have prayer and then uh, close out the Bible study for today. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for being with our forefathers and for sending your Son, our Lord and Savior, for making life and eternal life available to us, giving it to us, not making us earn it. Through the mighty work of Christ, may our days be to his glory and honor, to your glory and honor, and in accordance with your will. Amen.